Good evening, everybody. Welcome to The Storytellers. Tonight's going to be a fun night. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, the dynamic and incredible John Buscema, but not in a way I think you're expecting because everybody's talked about his Marvel work and that's what we all, what we all know him from. But uh, he had a long career before that, uh, illustrating comics for Dell and other pu publishers. And, you know, I'd seen some of his artwork and, of course, it's beautiful as always, but it's pre- Jack Kirby. It's before he was introduced to the power of Marvel and the power of Jack Kirby layouts and stuff. And then once he adapted that, I mean, you know, his his ability as a draftsman, you know, took that to a whole nother level. But I think it's going to be fun to compare and contrast uh, his work, his earlier work uh, before he got what I call Kirby fied. And uh, who better to talk about it than one of the foremost John Buscema um, uh, aficionados and an incredible painter, Mr. Joe Jusco. Hey, Joe. Hey, bud. How you doing? I'm doing good. How are you? How's Syracuse? Is it storming yet? Uh, not yet. We're expecting it on Friday, though. We're, we're, we're going to let you guys in Buffalo have all the joy this year. You want that no, golden ball yeah. for all you as, pal. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna be hitting it hard on <laughs> on uh, uh, Saturday, I think. Uh, I, I think Friday over here is where we're supposed to get nailed. Yeah, Friday. Okay, Saturday, maybe it is Friday. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> but hey, uh, look, look at this, folks. I just want to show every. There it is. That's the original 1978 first printing hardcover that I, I bought as a kid. And uh, you know, the title of this thing is you know uh, when John Buscema broke his own rules because. And he wrote that book. He, he had these wonderful drawings in there about, you know, one way to tell the story, the, which he kind of says is the DC way. <laughs> and then the Marvel way, you know, uh, which is much more dynamic. And I think that's what we're going to talk about tonight is 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 before he 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 got curvy fied. It's you really know? yeah, it's really interesting to see in that book how he does the side by sides of what 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 normal people would do and then what what real people would do. And honestly, it's like if you look at the early stuff, it's how he drew before he got to Marvel. You know, yeah, so it's not just the the the, the 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 DC way. It was his way of drawing. You know, right. And and it was sort of you know you look at just about any other comic of the day. That's how the comics, with the exception of uh, of of a few, you know, Kriegstein and and uh, uh, the guys at the EC at EC right. and um, uh, and of course Kirby, how they laid out stories was you know uh, completely different. But most, by and large, a lot of the the you know it was pretty standard looking. They were stuff. relegated to the six panel pages. Yeah, and it's, it, there's not a whole lot you could do with six panel pages. You know, I mean, John obviously yeah. Ron learned how to do that, but at the time, I mean, if you look at anybody, Alberto Gioletti. You know, who did tons and tons of stuff for Gold, Gold Key, and Dell. I mean, beautifully right. drawn. He's one, he's one of my idols, Gialetti, but it's not mm -hmm. the most exciting stuff. Beautifully drawn. Right. But, you know, not dynamic mm -hmm. at all. Right. And, and, and that all, that's all about the layouts and how you, the panels, how many panels you put on a page is irrelevant. Right. Because you look at, you know, you look at Kirby uh, in his, uh, you know, his golden years at Marvel. Uh, you know, they, he never, went out of the panel box, you know, uh, and exactly. he, he, he would do lots of grids, him and Ditko, but it's what, how they arranged the illustration within the panel, which was mm -hmm. what's so amazing. Yeah, 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 exactly. It's a, they, they knew how to foreshorten stuff. They knew how to, they knew how to crop, they knew how to crop mm -hmm. the dramatic effect. And that's something that John learned later on also, you know, with, with this entire sequence, I think there's a sequence where a guy is talking to his boss in the office and there's <laughs> yeah, there you go. And then and there's, there's the boring way of doing it, and then there's John's way, which has the right. hand propped and the foreshortening, and it's it's it, he knew every shortcut, yeah. but effective way to tell the story, you know. Yeah, and and the other thing, and, and we'll see that when we start looking at some of John's uh, earlier work, is that if you notice in this, um, most of the figures are all relatively the same size. Mm -hmm. Uh, the camera angles too are all at eye view, pretty much, except for uh, this middle, uh, this uh, uh, fourth one here. Right. Um, you know, it's you know functional, it, it, it's well drawn, you know, but uh, it ain't that. Right, exactly. And this is what I'm talking yeah. about that that bottom that bottom right panel. Mm -hmm. You know, where he would learn how to crop stuff. You know, which which was also expeditious, but also dramatic. You know, exactly. Exactly. And this is what they used to call a, a talking head page. Mm -hmm. um, it's prevalent in the comic strips. And, and you know, you got to have these, you know, there's exposition and things that have to be told to the readers. But the way he lays this out, 
is, is amazing because there's movement here. You right. know, the, the, the pull of this guy's jacket, you know, yeah. that hand here where he's, you know, he's going down on his hand, lighting a cigar. It's an this, action. This page reminds me a lot. Sorry to cut you off. This page reminds no, me no. He did a he did a um a framing sequence in a in a I think a Peter Parker spectacular Spider Man comic where they're all sitting in a bar in a booth, uh, Joe Robinson I think Mary Jane uh, Peter Parker and and J Jonah Jameson are all sitting in a booth and it's pages of them sitting in a booth talking and he right. was able to make that dramatic by how he cropped stuff and his camera angles I mean it was amazing it, it, yeah it, it's kind of like the 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 poker game. Or the, the the card game in Casino Royale, you know, it, it was it was that exciting. It was just the guys playing cards, but it was right. that exciting. And there's the, the still a framing sequence he did of these guys sitting in a booth at a bar was fascinating. How it never lost your attention, you know, yeah. talking heads, but composed like this, you know. That, that to me, those are the sequences that separate the men from the boys. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, when everybody's starting out, they're drawing all the action, the fight scenes, and all that. And you know, anybody, everybody, his brother can do that at least perfunctory, you know. But it's this kind of stuff, you know, uh, people talking, people doing uh, banal things, uh, uh, and, and then adding the the levels of um, of uh, just natural gestures. You uh -huh. know, you look at him lighting this cigar uh and and how he's holding the cigar down by his side here right uh, you know th those those nuances um you know you'll see him uh, a woman holding a teacup you know and maybe the pinky fingers out a little bit you yeah. know it, it's those little details to me that i look at and i'm like oh, yeah yeah nailed well, it you know? he, he he obviously acted out his characters in his head as he was drawing them you know, right. and Steranko had mentioned to me one time, because even in my paintings, because I, I learned to draw by copying John's stuff when I was a kid. And I right. retained a lot of what I saw in his work in the way I still compose things and everything. And and, sure. and Steranko had asked me once, he said, you kind of act out your figures as you do as you're drawing them. Right. Because I could tell. And I said, yeah, well, I got that from John, you know, because John obviously did that. And, you know, if you want somebody's always doing something, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and, and even if they're standing, they're never just standing there, you know, they're mm -hmm. doing something is there's something going on with it with the figures and that's what made his work so interesting for me right and, and you know what i think that uh, all the great artists have too is that they have that visual library um now i talked to howard about this one time um you know, there was a phrase that i ran by him that i heard and i thought was very true it's that you know artists and writers uh aren't participants they're uh they're bystanders they watch mm -hmm. the world you know I find myself at, you know, parties and stuff like that. If nothing exciting is happening, I'm looking, I'm looking right. at things. I'm looking at how somebody's sit, sitting, you know, what's the gesture, you know, what does that foot look like? You know, right. uh, why are a woman's buttons on the wrong side of a shirt? You know? <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I've always said, it's like, you have to learn not to look at something, but to actually see it. I, I, I say the same thing. And yeah. I watch movies, I'll watch movies and I'm watching how scenes are composed, how the lighting is, is hitting a certain scene. And right. I'll, miss, I'll miss entire blocks of dialogue sometimes because I'm studying what's on the screen. Right. You know, and, and I do right. it constantly. That That's just, it's a, it's a naturally occurring, uh, you know, uh, a thing that I do is just to, to observe what I'm looking at and, mm -hmm. and, and try to retain it and see how I can maybe use that at some point yeah. in the future, you know? No, oh, definitely. I, I really believe we have these, these sections of our brains, these libraries, as I call them, where this stuff goes into, and it might not be filtered out yet, but there's that point that comes. Like I drew a picture today um, of a of a woman sitting on a couch, and um, you know the angle was was sort of like this last panel, you know, mm -hmm. like like at hip level, and there's a guy in the foreground, and she's in the background. She's got her legs crossed, and her, she's got her arm up on the um, on on the sofa, and the other arm across her cross leg. Very natural looking pose, uh, and it all came from my head because I've seen that. You right. know, I, I, you know, I've, I've seen a woman sit like that, you know, and, and I've admired it, you know, and yeah. it went into right. my head, you know. Right. Uh, and then it, it just comes out, you know. Yeah. I, I, that, that's something that most of those guys back then knew how to do. I mean, they, they were they were real students of the human form, you know, and, 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 and there's, which is why they all were able to drape clothing as well as they did. You know, it's like they, they saw what was around them and they retained it. You know, yeah, and, and that it's just that's just something that because they had to know how to draw everything back then. 
Yes. You know, they, 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 the pre superhero stuff, they would do right. a comics one day, doing do, do westerns the next day, a gangster one, and one day a right. romance book the next day. And all of that was stuff they had to know how to draw. So they, they were like just libraries of stuff. Oh, and absolutely. Then, now, I, I pulled this panel here because uh, I think this is from Seven Voyage of Sinbad. Yeah. Uh, and it really illustrated to me uh, the, uh, the the non-Marvel way of, of doing something. Because yeah. the way this is framed, you've got these vertical figures. They're sitting straight up. One guy's got his arms crossed like he's, you know, talking to his accountant. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's this, this, <laughs> this, this like, big giant, uh, you know, dragon sitting here. He's like, uh, how are we going to pass that? I know it's pretty funny. I, I, know, what I, it's very what I find interesting about it too is that his inking at this point, it's like everything seems to be inked in the same with the same textures, you know, the rock wall and the dragon and the ground and everything. Yes. It's like it's that it's that that loose kind of brushy, feathery stuff just to get some texture and some some value in there. But not yeah. a whole lot of attention was paid to, to what he was doing as far as that went. It, it's the way he handles these rocks and stuff with the brush, it's kind of, it kind of reminds me of uh uh, Tom, uh, the guy he used to, uh, he used to draw the Lone Ranger for Dell. Tom. Oh, yeah. Jesus. I can't remember. I, 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 know, know. I know who you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he used to be at the New York comic cons and stuff. Nice guy. Really nice guy. Um, gosh, I can't remember his name. Anybody in the chat, if you remember who that is, put that up in there in the chat for me, will you? Um, but, and then, you know, I tried to find something comparable to this. And it came up with this one, you know, so we got another dragon thing. Uh, these guys, you know, obviously this is sort of a, a different, you know, theme, but, um, but look at, look at how he handles the rocks here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this is all brush. Much more illustrative. Yes. It's all brush. Yeah. Yeah. This is all brush. Look at that. It is uh, the, how he uses the ground here, uh, perspective to force your eyes back here. You know, right, right, and it's, not, it's, and it's not over rendered the way the Sinbad stuff was just to get texture on there. It's all very, it's very decisive, right? What he's doing here, and, and it's all like if you notice, like the way the inking works in the background, it kind of leads you from background to foreground, you know what I mean? He does right. a thing with it, but looks like a staggering of the texture, which works yeah. really well. This is very reminiscent of uh, how Kubrick would use negative space around things, and then he would put the detail and the uh. Um, the shadows and darkness on the places he needed you to look, right? You know, and yet, yet everything is still there. You're you're a participant uh, uh, as a viewer because you fill in anything that that's not there. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And 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 over here again, it's like uh, it, it, there, it's it's still not uh, like like a cornucopia of textures of different textures, but he, the rendering is a lot cleaner and a lot more precise than it was on the the, the Sinbad stuff. Yeah, I just I just love. The, this brushy work on the muscles here. It's my favorite style of his ink. God, with, with, so with good. The feathery brushy stuff he did. You know, when he did the pen work, it was it was kind of cool. It was nice. It was it was really clean. You could see the drawing, but I really loved that lush brush stuff he did. Yeah, I mean, he didn't do much pen work in his later uh, career. The only thing I can think of is Conan the Rogue. Yeah, he did that. There are a couple of really really late Savage Swords that are almost all pen. Oh, is that right? The very end, yeah. There's a two part okay. with these big shaggy like demons that are that are like mimicking people's voices and stuff in a cave, and that oh. that, that story is almost all pen. Oh, I'd like to see that one. Oh, that's cool. Because I really loved Conan the Rogue. I thought um, that was amazing. You know, uh, the color sucked, but and the printing. Yeah, sucked. yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm not. I, I don't remember seeing the color. Up at Marvel, I remember when he was working on it. I was talking to Tom DeFalco, and that was like that was sort of that was going to be his baby. He plotted the story out. They had, I think they had to bring Doug in or somebody else to help to help flesh it out because it, he yeah. was not put himself into a corner. He did the same thing with uh, with Merlin when he did Merlin way back in the seventies. Oh, uh, uh, but they gave him an open deadline, and that's like the worst thing you can ever do to an artist is give them an open deadline. Oh, I know because I know. It's, and that's why there were like eight billion versions of every page because he was redrawing it and redrawing it. And if yeah. you look at the early pages, he was doing the brushy inking stuff, his normal inking yes. style, and he discarded those, and he went back and redrew them again, and he did the pen work. So finally, I was talking to Tom, and he's like, I, we, kind of, we finally had to call it in, or he'd still be working on it, you know, like 10 years from now. <laughs> he, was just, he became obsessed with, with, with that book, you know, and, and yeah. there are certain guys, because of their speed, if you take, if you take deadlines away from them, 
and you give them too much time, they obsess. And John was obsessing over that book. He really was. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, I, I think he was um, uh, he really didn't love doing superhero stuff. And and Marvel pretty much used him primarily to lay out stuff. And, you know, because it was so solid, everything, the storytelling, you know, I, I, he probably felt like um, sort of an unrequited love was to actually get in there and, and do something he really wanted to do with his illustrations illustrative chops and all that kind of stuff, you know? But his attention span for that seemed to be kind of short because every now and then he'd get the itch to that he wanted to ink stuff. He'd say, well, I want to ink the book, you know, and he would ink like yeah. two of the Conan in a row and then he wouldn't do it. Then he wouldn't ink them anymore. You know, it's like, he yeah. likes he likes storytelling. You know, it, yeah. he, was, he was a storyteller. So I don't think he minded doing the breakdowns as much. One, because it was for him more money because he was that. Yeah. Fast. And two, he just liked telling a story. Right. You know, I think by the time he got to the finishes, I think that became a bit tedious for him. You know, and uh, yeah, I remember uh, again talking to Tom DeFalco where, where where John was lamenting how Foster had a week to work on a page, and it's oh my god, I would kill to have a week to work on a page, and we were laughing. It's like you know, he he wouldn't know what to do with a week to do it. Do we work on a page? He couldn't do yeah. it because he's too fast. You know, yeah, and Foster. I mean, you've, you've seen. I'm sure you've seen Foster originals. I mean, they're like yeah. you know, yeah. gigantic. You know, yeah. one panel is like half a comic book page you yeah know? yeah i saw i was over at the syracuse university a few years ago during one of the uh, the syracuse cons and they brought out a bunch of the originals because they have the collection there at that yeah syracuse. yeah and uh jesus they're just amazing just an astonishing yeah. person absolutely astonishing i went there a few years back with the ncs and uh we could choose artists we wanted to see and, and i knew that they had uh, the roy crane collection there mm. so i had them bring out all these Roy Crane Sundays and, and the, the dailies that were done in craft tent and stuff. And, and also Frank Robbins, they had a ton of Frank Robbins, uh, Johnny Hazards, uh, gorgeous. Just yeah. I was like, Oh yeah. my God. Yeah. I, I, I need to make another appointment. You have to call up and make an appointment to go see the stuff, but the yeah. fact that it's there and they'll pull it out for you is just absolutely, it's such a, treat. Oh, and you can pick it up and hold it. And it's, it's amazing. Yeah. 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 It's really great stuff. I so heard. here's, here's, here's one from Hercules. Which is funny because uh, you know John did Hercules at at, uh, at Marvel, you know the Marvel Hercules. Um, look at the beautiful rendering on that bull. Look at the uh, mask on the bull. I know. Yeah, it's that that is amazing. Um, and, and you know the, la the this um this panel right here. This is you know we've seen this Conan figure a mm -hmm. million times. I mean, uh, this is all him, you know. But but how he framed this here beautifully drawn yes but later on he would do that in a much more dynamic way yeah i, I mean it, it it works within the context of what he's doing here and the style here that probably one of the more dynamic books he did for mm -hmm. um for uh fidel um because i guess the subject matter that's right up his alley you know it's the mm -hmm. kind of stuff that roy was giving him when he was doing the avengers you know it's like roy knew that he hated superheroes so he he gave him hercules he put the hydra in that in that red guardian story you know, it's like he was giving him all kinds of stuff that, that that he loved to draw within the context of the superhero stuff. Right, right. This, this was really right up his alley. Yeah, I love the way he used to draw Hercules. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, especially later on when he came back in the 80s and, and had that nice run with Roger Stern and, mm -hmm. and Tom Palmer. Uh, I love that Hercules. A lot, of that, like, a lot of that was Tom, though. I mean, because I, yeah. remember, I remember seeing those those layouts up in Marvel and there was practically nothing there. I mean, he was he was really... They were bare bones layouts because he knew Tom could finish them, you know. Yeah. So almost all the machinery that you're seeing in those pages and all, yeah. the, all the shadowing and the draping, that's all Tom. Oh yeah, definitely. With John's dynamics underneath it, you know. Yeah. This is, this is one I, I found. I was trying to find something where he had somebody fighting a bull, uh, and I found this this from Conan. Uh, and speaking of Tom, this is Tom Palmer inks on uh -huh. this. Uh, I can blow that up. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. You see the, the way he framed the first panel. Yeah. Yeah. And look at the spread on those legs. You know, uh, yeah. you believe that man could actually toss that bull. Right. 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 It's, it's so, so much more dramatic. There's so much more weight to the figures at this point. Yeah. Like, like this one. I don't believe this guy could do that to this bull. Right. <laughs> that bull <laughs> is heavy. <laughs> well, he is he is Hercules, though. You know, that's, that is true. That's true. But look at the muscles on this bull here. This yeah, is freaking the, amazing. Yeah, there, there are a few. There, there's a lion, I think, in that story, and there's there, 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 there are the other shots of this bull 
And it, they're just amazing that could, the, the way he was able to emphasize the musculature with the shadowing and the brushwork and stuff like that. I mean, even, even the one in the upper, the upper left panel, I mean, that is, that's a lot of work in that neck, in the neck of that bolt, you know? Oh yeah. It, 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 where he's tossing him in panel three, that underside there, mm -hmm. uh, that's a tough angle. Yeah, no, it's brilliant. It's done brilliantly. It really is. Yeah. So let's see what else we got here. Ah, here we go. Ah, Sinbad. We're back to Sinbad. Yeah, yeah. Uh, beautifully drawn. Again, uh, the figures are all relatively the same size. Yeah. Which kind of makes a, a boring layout. Look uh, at the draping. Look at the draping on the, the pantaloons in uh, in panel one, though. Yeah. And, and, and the body language on the Cyclops in panel two. You know, him coming through the trees. Yes. I mean, it's just, it's, it's, it's also natural looking. It really is. It's amazing. Yeah, he's got that... Um, uh, the, the, those clouds back there reminds me of uh, pile. Yeah, yeah. He, he was he was definitely being a little bit more illustrative back then. I again, I, I kind of like the rocks that we saw in the other panel. I think they were a little over rendered for what he mm -hmm. for what he was trying to do. Right. You know, but uh, but yeah, you you could see the evolution of his work in these pages. Yeah. So I tried to find something like with pirates, you know, and I found this beautiful, mm. <laughs> beautiful piece. Uh, a little over rendered by uh, Alfredo Alcala, but look at the layout. Do you remember when this stuff first came out, though? I remember when the first Savage Sword came out, inked by Alcala, and everybody just went, "Holy crap!" You know, it was, like, it was the this? first first Conan book I ever bought was Savage Sword number two, Black yeah. Colossus. Right, right. Which and, was and, uh, the first you, one. You never saw anything like that before. I, I remember I was in high school when that came out, and uh, Super Snipe Gallery in uh, New York City had a ton of the originals for sale and we would go up there after school every day and just go through the binders and check out the originals wow. you know I, I don't know if he got them from john or if he got them from from alfredo but they they had binders of of, of bisema alcala uh conan stuff you know Do you remember and, what they were going for they were expensive i mean I'm oh, talking really 74 75 they were asking like 400 bucks a page Really? Yeah, yeah they wow, were that you know, is super, super, super snipe was super expensive you know okay. but yeah they were a ton of money a ton wow. of money. You know, I remember uh, going to a Chicago con in 1987, I think it was. Uh, and there was a guy, a dealer there who had a stack of Busema pages. Uh -huh. And they were 25 to 50 bucks. You remember those days? I know. Oh, my God. I, I ended up buying um, uh, a couple pages from Doc Savage number one. Mm -hmm. uh, and I still have them. I still have them uh, with that were inked by Tony DeZuniga. Right. And uh, but I, I, had, I had the opportunity to get so much more. And I just I didn't. For, like, for some uh, reason, you know, you know, you know what it was, though? It's like when that stuff was cheap, we were all working and trying to pay our bills, too. So there wasn't a lot of money to go around. That's true. You know, uh, uh, Mitch Itkowitz used to live on Staten Island with me where I, and Mitch was an art dealer. And he would come over at my house with a bunch of stuff he had for sale. And like I'd, I'd have to pick and choose like certain pages. Like I, I bought the splash to Subby Six, that great shot of Tiger Shark holding Dormer by the arm. Yeah, yeah. For like $75, you know, back, <laughs> back, back in like 86 or, or 87 or something. You yeah. Know? And, and he had other stuff too. He had the, he had the, the, the Marvel pinup, the Marvel poster. Oh, the December one? Bissema Senate Marvel poster. Yeah, yeah. It was like $100 and I just didn't have it. You know, it's wow. like, yeah, it was a hundred bucks. That's uh, the it, one that had Doc Savage on it and then they had to move, take him out when they reprinted out. it. Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> they lost the license. Did they turn him into somebody else, or did they? Uh, did they? They just yank him completely. I can't remember. I think remember. they just yanked him. I think they just yanked him. Yeah, but but it's like it's amazing how cheap with stuff was back then. If you had, and if you had the foresight or the money to buy that stuff and stock up on it, you know, it's like you you're a four, you're a millionaire today. Oh my gosh, yeah. Look look at the layouts here. This is beautiful. Yeah. This, that that third panel with no no borders on it. And this uh, again. Uh, the kind of stuff that he wasn't doing pre-Marvel, you know, like all the foreshortening and the cropping, like the, you know, and stuff like that. It's uh, the, 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 the cropping in the final panel is something he wouldn't have done back then, you know, right. or, or panel, panel four, you know, that, that kind of action in panel four, that's all stuff he picked up from Kirby. Oh, absolutely. Uh, just the, the spread of the legs in panel mm -hmm. three here. I mean, uh, uh, Conan bent over here, uh, you know, ready to face this guy. Yeah. And that guy, you know, pulled back the dynamic tension in his body as he's pulling back the sword, you know, ready to draw the sword. Right. That's and it's, I, great. The background tree in panel one, too, that's sort of like it, it's the line of sight of Conan to the guy. 
Yeah, see, yeah. See the branch, see the branch in the background that works as sort of the line of sight that connects to both 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 the characters. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's just really, it's it's just it's very cool design work. Yeah, and and this uh, was it one two three four panel five. This one here. Look at the 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 foreshortening on the leg mm -hmm. here. You know, it's like we're down here. We're like a you know a mole rat looking off this guy's leg. And you really believe that guy is off balance and just got nailed. You know what I mean? It's like the yeah. body is just so natural and the movement in it is it's, mm -hmm. it's so kinetic. Well, that's the one thing we talk about mass. Um, Buscema's characters always had gravity. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, their their feet were fairly planted on the ground. Uh, when they were supposed to be on the ground and they had right. weight, their body had weight. When, when he was drawing um, Wolverine, uh, it, when he took over that, when he started that series and he right. was inking it too. Holy cow. I mean, I, I thought that guy weighed 500 pounds, you know? Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. I know. And he was like, and he was this big too, you know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. He, he had him drawn short, short and everything. Short. I know. And that's the other thing that he was able to do too. If you look at like uh, the, whenever he drew Mephisto, he can he can shift the body language by just by a shift of a hip or a bend of a knee, and you got the entire body language of the character, you know. And it, it, and, and it, it, the subtlety, the subtlety of, of these little nuances that he would do mm -hmm. to to give body language and 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 weight to a figure always astounded me, you know. And you tried to do it because it looks so easy, and it's really not easy. Yeah, let's see. Oh yeah. Oh wait. Ah uh, shoot. I wanted to show uh, a Western that he had uh, done back in the 50s. Um, and I, I guess I forgot to put that in there. Oh, the, uh, the, the Luke Short Top Gun stuff or, or the Roy Rogers yeah, stuff? Yeah, yeah. Let's see if I can pull that up real quick. I might have one of the Luke Short books here. Hang on a second. In my, little, my, my pile of pre-Marvel pre Buscema stuff. Here we go. All right. This is Roy Rogers. Right, and that's all uh, pen work again. That's little pen. A little, little bit of brush, but almost all pen. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, just really boring. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's. This is, I, I never know see, it was John. Can you see this? This is a little different. This is. Hold the, on. Let, uh, me, let me put you up on is, uh, full screen. Okay. This is Luke Short's top Top Gun. He did a, He did two or three of these. Okay. Hold on. Uh, solo. There we go. And this is a little more dynamic, little little more oh, yeah. rendered whenever you're on the brush. Mm -hmm. Yeah. These are really good. I, I, I love the Luke Short books that he did. I think he did two or three of them. I've got two of them. I think there's a third one somewhere. Well, well let me see the cover of that. Oh, here you go. This is... Uh, Luke Short's this, Top Gun. Yeah, this is four color. Let me put a light on here and see if I can get the number out of it. This is... Do, do, do. Uh, Luke Short's Top Gun. This is a uh, four color 927. And what year is that? 50. This would be. Jeez, that my eyes suck. This is uh, 58. 58. Okay. Yeah, 58. Okay. Yeah. And what, what was his first work at Marvel? Was it uh, Tales to Astonish? It was. Uh, I. It, but they, I think it. The first one I believe was the Strange Tales story that he did over Jack's layouts. Uh, Strange he, Tales. Strange okay. Tales one fifty. He did a Nick Fury story. Uh, okay. Where Jack laid it out, and I think he he completely redrew Jack's layouts and stuff like that. But uh, it was again fairly, fairly pedestrian stuff. And yeah. Then, and then then he did Tales to Astonish eighty five, eighty six, and eighty seven. Okay, but and those were that was over Kirby's layouts too, wasn't it? Um, I don't know. I, I the, the, I'm not sure if the first one was. I know the first the first one, you could see, you could tell that he still wasn't getting down like the idea of like Marvel exaggeration because right. the, the Hulk splash, he looks like he's six feet tall instead of like six feet wide. You know, right, he's, right, he's, right. He's way too tall, and the torso was too long, and uh, I, the people were all great, but the Hulk wasn't really all that all that awesome. You know. Yeah, yeah. Started, I think he started to get it by the time the humanoid came along. That big green, that pink guy that he was fighting. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Remember, and and that splash page, I would kill to own. It's that one where the the humanoid has the Hulk by the face, and, and he's and he's like beating the crap out of the Hulk, and the Hulk is bent <laughs> back, and he looks like a beach ball. He's now then he's got the stocky the stocky balled up Hulk that he used yeah. to, which I absolutely loved. You know. <laughs> Okay. So, uh, 
yeah, yeah, this is, you know, that's not great here. But then look at this. Look at the difference. Yeah. Holy shit. Yeah, the action and the acting, you know, and the, yeah. and the body language. It's, 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 it's so much less pedestrian than the stuff he was doing. Yeah, this looks, almost looks like he was looking at uh, Girard stuff. Yeah. Because yeah. look at that background, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it's it's very and and like like the Conan the Rogue stuff. There's a lot of De La Fuente in this also. Mm. He was he was a big fan of Victor De La Fuente, which is I think the approach he did, he finally opted on on Conan the Rogue, which is uh, why it has such a European look to it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, there's only one guy who could draw horses as good as John Buscema, uh, and that was Gil Kane. Yeah, well, yeah. As far as action in in, in action and and, yeah. and and the most bizarre poses you could ever think of, those guys were amazing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, when I whenever I lay out a story of uh, uh, the figure dynamics, uh, there's two people I think of. Uh, and that is uh, John Buscema and Gil Kane. Mm -hmm. And then when it comes to the actual storytelling, the layouts of the page layouts and stuff like that, the, the guy I think of is Joe Kubert. OK, yeah. So it's those three guys that are in my head when I'm thinking about how That's I'm approaching a story. That's a great triple crown to have. It really is. It's, it's, I mean, you really can't go wrong with any one of those guys. And no. it's funny, when I was a kid, when I, it took me a long time to appreciate Gil Kane because when he was working for Marvel, was that, that whole sort of like skinless anatomy thing? Yeah. You know, it, 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 it kind of threw me. It threw me. Yeah. And, and I didn't quite understand Gil Kane back then. Uh, now, now Gil's, Gil's, after John, Gil might be my favorite like superhero cover artist, like a comic book artist, because the guy is just absolutely astonishing. His his ability to 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 pose, to move and foreshorten a figure and 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 put action to a figure, I think, is second to none. He, he, yeah. Even John, he's better than John at that. Actually, you know, I, I the, the most amazing posing mm -hmm. Gil was able to do. You know, and, and Gil's use of perspective, uh, like even you know, uh, you're, you're in uh, J. Jonah Jameson's uh, office. And uh, he might put the camera like a couple desks back mm -hmm. and uh, he might be standing talking to Robbie over by the window. But then where he's got the desk angle, you, the perspective of those desks is leading you right over yeah. to this guy. And it was just beautifully composed stuff, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's, I, I mean, there, there was some, somebody posted a page they owned the other day of uh, I forget what book it was, but we were talking about Dolphin. Remember the old Jason? Yeah. Story? yeah. And that's one of my favorite stories. I love that cover. And somebody posted a page there, a Gil Kane page they had, and they bought it because it had dolphin on it. And there's one little panel, and there's a shot of dolphin, like four short and swimming, and it was so natural. Wow. It was just this really natural, and it's a little tiny figure, but it was just, it just flowed. And I, it was like, you know, like, Jesus, how did he know how to do that stuff? So, so you know, and you know that he, he just, he knocked that out, you know? Oh, yeah. But yeah. It, was, it was brilliant. Yeah, that's great stuff. Great stuff. I, and I loved when, um, uh, Kane was inked by Ramita. Yeah. Because Ramita cleaned up a lot of that, uh, you know, uh, naked mannequin yeah. you know, look. He put kind of some fat and flesh on the faces and, and stuff and, and smoothed th things out and made the girls prettier and everything. But, right, right. but the dynamics were still there, you know? Right, exactly. As they, yeah, if you look, like, like there's a difference between Atkins inking Kane on Captain Marvel and Ramita inking Kane on Spider Man. Right, like, like Atkins inked that that skinless anatomy thing, which kind of worked. I mean, it was really quirky and it worked for, for, on the Captain Marvel stuff, but I, I don't think it would have worked on Spider Man. You know, three favorite cover artists. Me, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Kubert, without a doubt, uh, without a doubt. I, I, I think the guy was a genius as far as composing cover. You go through any DC cover that he did, it was brilliant. Um, mm -hmm. I'd like Busema. I, I think Busema is underrated as a cover artist, but uh, Ramita. Uh, I, I think Ramita's Spider-Man run is 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 completely undervalued as far as uh, his cover work. That, that 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 is his entire cover run from thirty-nine through say a mm hundred -hmm. or hundred and wait whatever it was. I think there's not a bum in that bunch. I mean, they're brilliant. They were absolutely brilliant. And the third one, or or are you including Busan? God, that's it, this is so tough. Um, I didn't say the show was going to be easy, Joe. Yeah, yeah. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> it's, tough to, it's tough to pick three because they, it, it, so many guys brought different things to it. I think over John, I would pick Gil. I thought mm -hmm. I thought Gil Gil was an amazing cover artist, especially yeah. when he was doing like all those, those box covers, which are close to impossible to compose anything in, and yeah. he was able to compose the most amazing things inside those boxed covers. Yes, but yes. Kubit would be my number one. I, I thought Kubit was absolutely an absolute genius. No, no matter what the genre was. 
Well, and I like Neil. I like Neil Adams. Oh, yeah. But his non-superhero stuff. I like his genre stuff. I like the yeah. horror stuff. I like the Western stuff. I like yeah. the mystery stuff. I thought those covers were almost like paperback covers done for a mm-hmm. comic book. You right. know, especially with the color palette that they used on them. You know, so I, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm more of a fan of Neil's non-superhero covers than I am a superhero yeah. stuff. I think my three favorites are, like you, um, Kubert, uh, Gil Kane. Mm-hmm. And the third one is Nick Carty. Oh, yeah. I forgot about Nick Carty. forgot about Nick. Yeah. yeah. Nick Carty made me spend a lot of money. Yeah. I forgot, <laughs> yeah. I forgot all about Nick Carty. I mean, the, 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 the Aquaman cover of him holding yeah. um, Mira is just one of my favorite pieces of all time. How about some of those Batlash covers? Yeah. Like that that and, one where he's hiding behind the tombstone and the Indian is, is walking by the colors on that, the purples and the white yeah. snow. Oh my yeah. God, it's so yeah. amazing! Yeah, and that, and that's where I think that DC had the edge on Marvel, where were, were the covers and the palettes they used. Yeah, you know? and, and and I think that Neil is the one who said he took credit for that of teaching them how to use color, the yeah. way they did in advertising, so you can get the grades of color and make it almost look like a painting. Right. He brought that in from advertising, and that's and that's when all the all the DC covers start to take on that look, like the 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 Cardi right. covers and the, the Neil covers and. And stuff like that. They all had that sort of like almost painterly quality mm-hmm. to them, you know. I think uh, Jack Adler had something to do with that too, because he was the production manager there and uh at that time. And and their covers, DC's covers were just, you know, from the late sixties through those early seventies, they were blowing Marvel away. I agree. It, I, agree. Yeah. I agree completely. You know, it, it, they're they're they were just they were so much more attractive and they had so much more depth to them than, than the Marvel covers did. Marvel covers were exciting, the the DC covers were and trawling, you know. Yeah, and they looked more professional. The colors yeah. were weren't as garish. The uh, you know the, a lot more color theory, you know. <laughs> you, you, you mean you mean the uh, the Grim Reaper on Avengers Fifty Two was garish? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who colored that, but Jesus, that can't be what John intended. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you know this this is uh, we talked a little bit. Uh, about this uh, backstage um this particular story is called uh, the train that vanished and i'm not sure what year this is do you know what year this is I, i'm i'm not sure i i i saved it off a site like uh of some years back and i can't remember it's got to be uh late 40s early 50s you think it's early 50s I, it's it's probably around there yeah, yeah. okay yeah, um, it's, it's, it's when he was doing uh, the Forbidden World stuff, and uh, and uh, what's what's what, what we got here? Let's go to the videotape. Yeah, he was doing, <laughs> he, was doing he was doing a ton of stuff for, for Forbidden World and Adventures of the Unknown. Let's see, did he do any covers here? He's, yeah, he didn't do any covers. He just did interiors. Like when he was he was doing this kind of stuff. He was doing the Adventures of the Unknown books. Whoops, okay. the camera. Oh this, yeah. You know, and then Forbidden Worlds. He was doing. He did a ton of Forbidden World stuff. Oh, okay. But what I like about this is um, his inking style here. The, the advertising look. Uh, let's see if I can blow that up a little bit. Look at all that beautiful pen work. Look yeah. at the shirts, uh, especially down here. Look at this. That looks like almost like an arrow shirt. Yeah, dog. yeah. I was going to say know? it looks like like an. He was a big Albert Dorn fan. So a lot of this stuff back then had the Albert Dorn feel to it, you know, especially his hands, you know, yeah. his, his hand gestures. And, and if you if you compare John's hands to Albert Dorn stuff, you can see where he got the big Dorn influence and had to do hands and stuff like that. And now this right here uh, and, and all this fine line inking is very Bernie Kriegstein to me. Yeah. Yeah. I can see that. You know, I, I, I just I. I've never seen this story, and I just love it. I just, but, I mean, I, and the fact that it's so early too. I'm sure it, it, it's it's John really kind of learning his tools at this point, you know, because it, you could see that that like, like the face in the upper the upper left panel the, in panel one, uh, there's almost no rendering on that, and and you'd never even think that was John at this mm-hmm. point, you know. I said the squinty eyes and the eyebrows and stuff like that, mm-hmm. but uh, but but aside from the way it's uh, aside from that, the way it's rendered, you would I don't think I would ever pick that out as being Busema. I, I wouldn't pick any of these panels for being Buscema. This one right here, that that type of shadowing on on these characters. The guy in the foreground, uh, I, I, that that's John's done that 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 profile, that back profile shot. Yeah, like, a billion times. I I would I would recognize that almost instantly. Yeah, 
But the, the layouts on this are, are so much stronger than that other stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, this is a perfect example of that foreground, middle ground, background, right. uh, but but extreme foreground, which really adds the depth to it, you know? Yeah. And he's got the camera angles moving. I mean, maybe it's because the train is uh, off kilter or something. I don't know what the story is, but uh, I, th there's a lot of movement here. Yeah, yeah. I, there, I, mean, I mean, he was doing as much as he could at the, to, to kind of get to get like sort of a cinematic feel to the stuff, but then went back to the, this sort of like mundane, you know, mm -hmm. Uh, uh, talking head page, you know, that's Buscema. Oh, <laughs> There's no mistaking that. No mistaking that at all. Yeah, and and this guy here too. The wall. Look at the, the thin legs. Right. Yeah, he's 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 had Wolverine walking that pose like a billion times as Patch. You know, if you put a patch on that guy, and he, it could be Wolverine walking. Right. I, I like this guy here. Uh, just the way the suit folds. Mm -hmm. uh, I really like that. Okay, now he's doing a little Ditko. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it's bizarre. Yeah. You know what he used to do really cool is like, like when he was doing these kind of um, uh, bizarre world type things, you know, like uh, dreamscapes, like M Mephisto. Right. You know, like he could... He would use his brush line and he would like draw these um, ribbons, these swirls um, that actually had depth to it. And right. So with stuff like bouncing up behind him and stuff. There was a, there was a time travel story in, uh, in, in four. I can't remember what the guys are. The big, the big tall guys with like the big heads. It was like four, like two forty three. Oh, the frost giants. No, no, no. It, it, was, it was, it was, they were aliens. They were like aliens with big eyes. It was like Thor 243 or 244, the time twisters, I think they were called. Okay. And, and he did a thing and he did, there's a, there's a panel in there that has that whole, that, that, that swirly space, you know, uh, other dimensional stuff that he used to do, you know, and, 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 and it, it, it was unique to him because he, he did that a lot on, on yeah. a lot of the science fiction type stories and it always seemed to work, you know, the, this, sort, yeah. this sort of like, like really bizarre surrealistic backgrounds. This looks like a, from a Rosie Greer movie. <laughs> <laughs> two yeah, yeah. guy. Yeah. <laughs> Doesn't it? Like two heads. That's pretty funny. Yeah, that, that, there, 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 there's a tangent that you don't want. Yeah. That's yeah. hysterical. Yeah. <laughs> That's really funny. And then I like the over-exaggerated running here. That's great. The cartooning, yeah. And, 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 and that's the kind of stuff that you saw later on when he did Weird World. You know, when yeah. you did the exaggerated cartooning with the elves, you know, it was that kind of stuff. Oh, uh, Nick Capello says that uh, this story is from Forbidden Worlds, number 87, 1959. Oh, oh, it's that late. It's that late. Wow. Okay. All right. Thank you, Nick. Now, here he goes, getting a little brushy. Yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's the advertising guy in him right there. Yeah. In fact, this whole page looks a little bit more brushy than the other stuff. I wonder if he just decided to pull the old number two out. Yeah, I don't know. It, it, it's it's like I was saying earlier, like when we were in uh, in uh, back room, um, he uh, he was experimenting with different inking styles during this whole period. You know, he would do like like on the Vikings or or uh, or um, I think Sir Gala, Sir Sir Lancelot. It was all pen. Uh, and then he would go and do like the heavy brush stuff on like Hercules and the Seventh Voyage of Sinbad, and, and I think the only, I think the only one he didn't ink himself when he did all of those 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 four color books was Spartacus. Spartacus were were his pencils, and I forget who who inked it, but he didn't ink that book. Oh, interesting. Which is bizarre, and you could tell because it's really sloppy, heavy inking. You know, oh, I, 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 he might have inked one page I, that I think looks like him, but the rest of it is definitely not him. Huh. And it's listed on the checklist as to as to who actually inked it. I just can't remember off the top of my head. What well, what year did uh, Buscema come over to Marvel? Uh, when, is it sixty six? Sixty six. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that, that, that's that, that's when he did the Strange Tales that that one off Strange Tales story, and then jumped on to uh, Okay uh, Tales to Astonish. And so, and then he started the Avengers in sixty seven. What uh, six? I think that was sixty six also. Oh, okay. And he bounced over right after right after Tales to Astonish. He bounced right over to. Uh, to it to the Avengers. I used to own the covers to Avengers 41 or 42 years ago, the original. Wow. Covers, and I, and I, long story as to how I, why I had to sell them. But yeah, I missed those covers. They were gorgeous. Wow. 
Uh, did you ever hear the story? Uh, and it's probably around this time, 60, uh, 66, 67. Um, there was a party and Stan Lee was there and, you know, he's notoriously bad with names. And uh, Stan leaned over to Neil Adams and said, who's that guy that just came in? And Neil looked at me and says, <laughs> he said, that's the best artist you got. <laughs> he says, that's, that's, that's John Buscema. I've never heard that story. Because, <laughs> yeah. because Stan is supposedly is the one who got, got, got him back, who called him up and supposedly talked him into coming back to comics again. So it's really odd that he wouldn't hit that he wouldn't recognize him. That's yeah. Yeah, maybe maybe John shaved, uh, yeah. shaved his beard off or grew a beard or something. I don't know. That's, that's or the story could be a full of shit too. You know, the, the, <laughs> there's a lot of those. And those guys never saw each other. I mean, Sinnott Sinnott didn't see Kirby for you know ten years that they worked together. Once. You know? Yeah. They yeah. only yeah. met once. Superman and Khan in the seventies. They were working together since since like sixty five. You know, it's yeah. like, and they never met. They had never that blew met. my mind. Yeah. You know. Um, the guy that used to do, uh, um, the Cisco kid, uh, Salinas, Salinas, uh, he never met the writer yeah. all those years, never met the writer. Yeah. It was so different. Like, I mean, it's, it, it, we take it for granted now, but back then it's like, if you weren't like, you know, living in the same town or the same city or, you know, it's like, you just never saw each other, you know, stuff got mailed in. I, and I still don't know how they made deadlines with stuff getting mailed in like, you, you know, USPS all the time. Right. Yeah. I mean, you've heard stories of stuff going missing, mm -hmm. you know, like, and, and they had to redraw stuff like the Avengers 79 cover and stuff like that. But uh, yeah, when you think about it, you know, and I, which is, I guess, why you had to live in New York at the time, you know, to work for Marvel at DC because you yeah. had to stuff most of the time, you know, you yeah. take the train in and drop stuff off. Most of those guys were in the tri state area, you know, Connecticut, New York, right. New Jersey, uh, where they could train in and then spend a day, you know, Drinking and schmoozing. <laughs> well, that, 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 that's where I consider myself fortunate. I grew up in New York City, you know, and Marvel and Marvel was right there. So it's right. Like, I, I I used to go up to Marvel all the time and just hang out for a day and walk around from office to office and yeah. you know, pick up work and stuff like that when I was first starting out. So it was a be definite benefit to be local and be able to, to visit mm -hmm. the offices on a regular basis. That was the beauty of the business back then is that it was much more insular. Uh, they, they were standalone companies. They weren't corporate uh, you know, uh, owned by these corporate monoliths. Right. And uh, of course, uh, pre 9-11, you could just go up. You take right. the elevator right on up. Uh, uh, there was somebody at the desk there. That was a you knew her at that point already. You knew yeah. her receptionist and she would just buzz you right in, you know. And exactly. You didn't have an appointment to go see anybody and you can hang out there all day long. You know, That's now, right. now it's kind of, you go up, you have an appointment with somebody, you go to see them and they usher you back out again. You know, it's yes. Crazy. Yeah. yeah, you're not prowling the hallways, introducing yourself, showing your portfolio right. or any of that, that 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 one on one. Yeah. Uh, and that's how you, you build relationships. That's how you got to know all the editors back then is you just went from mm -hmm. office to office, you know, and you would and they would see you and they see what you're working on. And you would talk to them. Yeah. You know, really, I, I got so much work uh, early on just by being in the office and going from office to office, you know, so oh, absolutely. Stuff, stuff that would have gone to, say, Bob Larkin or Earl Norm or something like that. You know, I happen to be in the office. Mm -hmm. Like, hey, get a cover. You want to do it? You know, it's like, yeah, sure, of course. Which I wouldn't have gotten had I not been there. You know, yeah, yeah. So it really was a boon. It was a boon. You were starting out to 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 to, to suck work up by just by walking around from office to office. And you know, like you could you deliver your artwork, and you could if you if you timed it right, you could pick up your paycheck that day. Yeah. Yeah, it was. It was. If you if you if you got your if you got the voucher on Wednesday before like noon, right? You know, it would cut yep. you a check, and if not, you had to wait. You know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that was amazing. <laughs> you know, it was so amazing. Yeah. And you drop off the work, and if the editor doesn't have anything for you, he takes you around and says, "Hey, hey, have you have you met Graham? You know, and he brings you over to another editor." And right, right. Yeah. Or, yeah. Or I would just take it upon myself to like bounce around stuff like that. You know, I'd, I'd stop into, you know, into Larry Hama's office or I'd stop into Louise Simonson's office, you know, and, so, and, and that's kind of what you did, you know, and and they kind of they always had so there was always something. There was always something laying around somewhere that they needed, you, even if it was just a pin up or something like that. Yeah. So you were, you were always able to get some work just just by being there, which which is is definitely not the way it's done anymore. You know, oh, no. Now, I don't, in D.C., out in California, I don't know how you you, you got to have like a, uh, you know, pass and everything else to, yeah. just to get on the property. I think. Yeah. You know? yeah. yeah, I guess. I guess I, yeah. I, 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 I moved out of New York City in 94 and moved to, to Pittsburgh. 
And that was the last time I went to the Marvel offices. So I haven't even seen the last two Marvel offices. You know, so I remember when they were on Park Avenue. Right. I mean, they were on 57th Street when I first started and 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 and, and Madison. And then they moved down to 28th and Park. And now those are the last offices I remember. I have a butcher who lived in uh in, in Pittsburgh when you were there and knew you. Oh really? His name is yeah, his name is Josh. Uh, I can't remember his last name. Okay. Uh, but he said, you know, he used to see you, uh, I don't know if it was at conventions or something. Cause he was a comic fan, uh, uh big guy, you know, uh, really I nice guy. I, but, so I, probably, I probably recognize I'm the worst with names. I'm great with, yeah. Faces, terrible with names. Yeah. Yeah. So, oh, that's funny. That. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Joe, I want to thank you for coming on. Is there anything about John that we didn't cover about this era here? I don't want to keep you all night. No, I, I, I think we pretty much covered it. I mean, it, it, it's, it, it was it was amazing. Like I said, I, I've hunted down his stuff. Uh, I, I, Michelle Mayo has a, uh, a John B. Summit checklist online that lists basically everything John ever did. You know, and I, I, I go by that checklist. And I try to seek out the pre-Marvel stuff that I can possibly find. Not the easiest stuff to find. It really is, no. you know. Um, Not a lot of demand for it. Yeah, but but it's like you would think that would, and and you can find them sometimes in like dollar bins, which is amazing to me, you know, because yeah, it, 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 it was, I'm not looking for collectible copies. I'm looking for reader copies because I want the artwork, you know, in the story. Right. So if I could find a, a copy for five bucks, I'm happy. Yeah, uh, but they're not easy to find unless you find high grade ones, and you know, I don't yeah. have a slapped copy of a book that John has a story in, you know. <laughs> Yeah, ex absolutely. Yeah, but, but yeah, it's it, it, it's it, and and I what I found fascinating about it is is the difference in the stories. I mean, the, the role he was doing romance stories back then, you know, in 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 the in the forties and fifties, and they were beautifully drawn. I mean, he, the guy always could draw great looking women. But as we mm -hmm. were talking about, I think yesterday we were messaging each other, and there was an example of a romance like splash that he did, and even his romance stories were more dramatic after he got to Marvel. You know, right. When he take up the Kirby, the way of Kirby framing and storytelling and stuff like that. And you, there was a decided difference in it. You know, the draftsmanship was always there. The dynamics, it's fun to see how the dynamics evolved over the years to the point where he became the house style, you know? Right. I, I liked his, uh, I like those romance stories he did in the early seventies. Uh, some of those comics are amazing. You've got Ramita, you've got him, you've got Steranko, yeah. uh, yeah. uh, 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 Colin, uh, you, you, everybody was doing that stuff, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. earning paychecks, you know, there was the, the, but the romance stuff, I mean, I, I mean, it, it was, it was beautifully done. The guys were handsome. I mean, the, 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 the girls were beautiful. And, and this, the storytelling, there was one, when I was still working as Howard Chicken's assistant back when I was like 18 years old, we were talking about John's romance stuff, you know, and there was one example that, that, that we were talking about where it's just a shot of a girl's head turning and looking over her shoulder, like, cause somebody called her and right. it's a guy's hand holding an apple. You know, it's it's like the guy with the cigar in, in, in the office, in the office scene. It's just right. a hand. It's a beautifully drawn hand holding an apple. And this girl sort of, sort of turning and looking over her shoulder with this surprised look on her face. And it's absolutely gorgeous, you wow. know. And, and I mean, it, it, at that point, it was just seemed to be like his natural way of doing stuff. Because, you know, he wasn't putting a whole lot of time into that stuff. Right. You know, I mean, they were beautiful full pencils. But really, how much thought was he putting into romance stories? You know, that was just a natural thing. But I, I never forgot that panel of him, of this 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 hand just holding an apple and offering it to this girl. It's a beautiful shot. Let's see if we can find it. Hold on a second here. Uh, Share screen. No. Okay. This one is that Ramita or is that Sinet who inked that? Which one? Oh, this one? one? That's Ramita. Yeah. That is Ramita. Okay. Uh, this is this is the story, actually. I I believe that is that the story with the apple. That might be the story. Oh wow! Let's see. Maybe not. Maybe not. Let me check my files and see if Look I. Yeah, that's great. I know I have it in my. Uh, in my hard copy files. Let me see if it's in my digital file. These are all originals too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And this is all stuff you couldn't give away some years ago. And now it's like people are asking a fortune for these pages. Really? Yeah. That doesn't surprise me. 
you know, Ramita and Buscema. What's this? Oh, that's an Avengers. That's uh, oh, okay. That's a uh, that's, that's Coletta. Ooh. Yeah, yeah. Not the greatest combo back then. No, I you know I think Coletta gets a bad rap sometimes. Well, uh, he, he he's my Thor guy. You know, it's it's like when yeah. we, when we, we like the Kirby stuff. I thought Sinnott was the only anchor for Kirby on the Fantastic Four. I thought Giacoya was the best anchor on Captain America. Yeah, you know, and 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 Vinny gave gave Thor a look unto itself. You know, uh, I mean, it, it, were there problems here and there? Sure, but it, it gave the book a really unique look. Yeah, this one I, I always thought this angle was really cool. Yeah, uh, you know, right through the through the car. Yeah, yeah, it's brilliant. Know? Yeah, that, that's you know that's some work. That's some thinking. Let me see. Let me, let me see really quickly. Where's my Wait, JP thing and see if that's I because like I said I know I have it in my hard copy files, but I would have to leave the the computer to go get it. Oh, that's a beauty. Yeah, I think I have it's it great body language. Yeah, I don't I don't think I have it. Yeah, he and Ramita were really good together. Yeah, there's one story that that the two of them did, and it opens up in a coffee shop, and it's a girl waitressing, and they're all yeah. around doing stuff, and there's two guys playing chess in the background, and everybody's doing it. Like one guy playing the guitar. Yeah, 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 yeah. The big guy. Splash. Yeah, it's a beautiful splash because, like we were saying, everybody's doing something, you know, and like the the body language on the two guys playing chess, the attitudes on the one guy's really concentrating on his move. Is, I mean, it was incredible. This is there. There it is. That's it right here. here. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's such a great splash. Uh, there, I think we're conflating two different ones because, yeah, this yeah. was at the chess yeah. in the coffee shop, but there was yeah. one with a guy playing the guitar, too. Yeah, look, look, look at the girl in the foreground. The girl in the foreground is gorgeous. Absolutely gorgeous. The one reading? Yeah. Or, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, well, yeah well, that, she's beautiful. I love I love this. They, they, when he did the class, he's sort of sophisticated looking chicks. Yeah. It's really just amazing. Yeah, I, I like the body language in this guy. He's kind of like what, looking at what she's reading. Yeah, you know, yeah. he's not just staring off in space. Right, he's not just there. He's dash, I, I, that's and that's what I was saying earlier. It's like everybody's always doing something. This guy's this guy's looking at a menu or something, you know, or, or bullshitting. It's it's really everybody was doing something. I love this guy, the the guy in the back with the dark hair playing chess. Oh yeah, yeah, with that fifties hairdo. Right. <laughs> Oh, that's a nice cover. That's Ramita. Yeah. Yeah, I believe that's Ramita. Yeah, that's definitely Ramita. Yeah, Ramita is one of those, was one of my first inspirations. Uh, you know, I, I could recognize his work immediately, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, I just, you know, everything looks so clean and... Uh, the guys were handsome. The girls were beautiful. You know, uh, and I thought what, was amazing, what was amazing about his Spider-Man stuff too, is that he was able to do the sort of spidery stuff, but it still, it still looked human. You know, he wasn't like a contortionist and his stuff was all over the place, but he, and one of the things he said, I, there was an interview with him one time. He said that when he was doing Spider-Man, his thing with Spider-Man was to never have him standing still or standing like, or standing straight. Cause Spider-Man is like, right. would hang, he hangs on, walls be on the wall. Yeah. So if you're gonna draw Spider-Man in the panel to have him standing somewhere is sort of self-defeating. You know what I mean? So he was mm -hmm. conscious to never have him doing nothing, and unless it was like really important to the story. You know? Yeah. It was easy. It, it just made more sense to have him just hanging out somewhere, hanging on a wall. You know, for, to bullshit to talk about somebody or think to himself about something. You know? And that he, made perfect, that made perfect he, sense. He took Spider-Man to a whole nother level. I mean, you know, Ditko created it. And, and wrote the language for the character, but but Romita cleaned it up and 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 made it palatable to uh, you know a wider audience. You know, it became a soap opera. You know, and yeah. it, it became a bunch of people that you really wanted to know. You know, you mm -hmm. I, I remember when I was a kid, I was home. I was homesick from school, and I had a full run at, at this point of, of Spider Man. I picked them up, and, and it was an old record store that used to sell back issues of comics and stuff like that. So you were able to get like, like, you know, the really early Ditko issues for like, you know, a quarter to 50 cents a piece and stuff. So I, I had put together a full run and it was like, I don't know, I was maybe 12 years old 
So at, at that point, I, I think Spider-Man was up to like maybe 106 or something like that. And I had the full run. And I just write and I took them out and I read just the Peter Parker stuff. Mm -hmm. I didn't read any of the Spider-Man stuff. I went through every issue and read just the Peter Parker stuff. And it read like a soap opera. It really did. You know, I mean, they the Peter Parker stuff all stood on its own without the Spider-Man story. And I found I never forgot that I did that, I did that or, or, or how fascinated I was that 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 particular subplot and storyline worked all by itself. You know, I have to say that my favorite stuff in the Spider-Man comics was the Peter Parker stuff. I mean, yeah, yeah I, I, I was glad when he would start fighting the Green Goblin or the Lizard or whatever. But I really dug the relationship stuff, you know, like especially when he was in high school uh, and he had just gone, started going to college, you know, right. and, and I got to that age and I'm like, you know, I can relate to this guy. And uh, I just I, I just thought it was great. You know, I, I think they went off the rails by by making him and Mary Jane uh, get married. Yeah. Um, you know, you change the entire, you know, right. concept of what the, the, the book was about. That was the whole testament, though, to to what what Stan and 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 John were doing as far as creating those characters. And and Stan gets a bad rap for a ton of stuff, but Stan is the guy who wrote the wordage for those characters, who made oh, yeah. them palatable and made you like them. Yes, you know I mean, I mean, it, it may seem the same, seem you know, uh, you, you know, kitschy and 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 dated today, but at the time, that dialogue worked perfectly. You know, yeah. and and you, it, you really seem you wanted to be friends with those people. You mm -hmm. want to know them, you know, which is why when Gwen Stacy died, you were so upset. Mm -hmm. You know, and Stan, Stan's New York sense of humor really comes through, you mm -hmm. know, like uh, the dialogue that he would write for the thing or he would write for Spider-Man uh, was was very funny and very New York. Yeah. Uh, which which I love because I grew up on Long Island. Mm hmm. And, uh, you know, I got that and I knew those people and I, you know, uh, it really resonated with me. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and another thing about those books, the Ditka ones and the Romita ones, is that when they drew the city, you know, it felt like New York City. The buildings weren't accurate. No. You know, the buildings were cartoon versions of buildings. But I, I, you know, being as how I was born and raised in Manhattan, it felt they feel more like New York City to me than the really highly referenced stuff today. You know, there was something mm -hmm. about them that they, they seemed if they, if, if they drew like an alleyway, it felt like an alleyway. You know what I mean? Because it wasn't pretty. It wasn't it, it was it was and it was rudimentary, but it just seemed more authentic to me somehow. And it still does. Now, you are know? you a Ross Andrew fan? I like I, I like some of Ross's stuff. Uh, I, I wasn't a big fan of the Ross Andrew Spider-Man stuff. There was something about his his faces that he always seemed a little bit contorted to me that kind of bothered me. Mm -hmm. You know, the exaggerations on him and stuff like that. And but I because I grew up on Ramita. Ramita was my Spider-Man artist, mm -hmm. so it was kind of hard for me to um, to, to, to accept the Ramita stuff, the the the, uh, the Andrew stuff after Ramita left and came. I, I asked the question because. Um, yeah, he's a bit divisive. A lot of people don't care for his cartoony uh, style. But the one thing that he did was his New York was real. Yeah. Uh, you know, you you knew you you could tell where these guys were because he photo referenced a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, he didn't cop. You know, he take pictures of it and use it as right. reference and make it work. But it had that feel. And and I and I've told the story before, and I'll never forget when Spidey one thirty eight came out, the Mind Worm story. Mm -hmm. And, and and Peter's going to go live with with Flash out in the Rockaways, and at that time you remember the Rockaways was you know it's like burnt down buildings right, and, and right. empty lots and all that kind of stuff, and there he is taking the taxi cab and there's the ocean on the one side and like there's a building sticking up and then there's this empty lot with rubble right. on it and shit as as the as the car is going by and I'm like. Uh -huh. I've been on that road, right, you know, right, uh, we used right. to take that road to go to Kennedy, you know, <laughs> right, right, exactly. You know, exactly. it just felt so, so real to me. Yeah. And, 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 and again, it, it was referenced, but it wasn't slavishly referenced the way it's right. today. So it just somehow felt more authentic to me. You know, I yeah. was, looking, I was looking through uh, like, like Ditko and, and, uh, and Ramita Spider-Man stuff recently. And I was like, Jesus, it just, it smells like New York. It felt like New York. You know, mm -hmm. and, 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 and I don't know if it's just because New York doesn't look like that anymore, you know, because mm -hmm. it, it's been built up and it, it's, it's a lot of those areas aren't there anymore. Right. But, uh, it's, it, that's the New York I grew up in, you know, so that that always felt like like the, the authentic New York City to me. Yeah. Yeah. And the, uh, Ross Andrews figures, you know, were a little wonky sometimes. Uh, his Spider-Man did, didn't have quite that heroic look that that Ramita had. But I would submit that that. Andrews was closer to Ditko 
in that yeah. it was kind of um, uh, eclectic. Yeah. No, I, 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 would, I would definitely agree with that. Yeah. Without a doubt. Yeah. Uh, but I'm a huge fan of, of Ross Andrews stuff. It's, and it's ironically, that, that, you know, since we're doing this, about talking about John, that was a character that John never seemed to be comfortable with. Spider-Man. Spider -Man? Yeah. I, I think if there was one character that John just seemed uh, – out of, out of place with whenever he drank. I mean, I know he he was he was when he did those issues with Mooney. Yeah, did, like like a nine or ten issue run. Uh, I don't know how much of that was was had to have Ramita layouts to it or Mooney cleaning it up. Yeah, you know, uh, it, I think it was both. Uh, uh, yeah. uh, Ramita did do the layouts, right? Uh, and then Mooney could and and I think Ramita went in and touched up some faces. Too, yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. I I because I, I know the webbing. John never got the webbing right. So you know the webbing was all Mooney. You know, uh, cleaning the webbing up and stuff like that. But, yeah, uh, I I love those books. The the, the two issue lizard one is, is one of my oh. favorite arcs of all time because he did the best lizard man. He really did. Yeah, he's still, he's still my favorite lizard. Yeah. I'm sorry, John Romita, but that that two issues with 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 the lizard were just friggin' incredible. Oh yeah. Incredible oh, you stuff. know what? He looked like a lizard, not a dragon. Right. You know, lizards don't have teeth like that. Yeah, you know. Yeah. Yeah. He, yeah, yeah. He really looked like a lizard, and so they hit so him later on with the teeth, and and, and they took they they made him like hissing. He's not he's now he's he's unintelligible and stuff. It's like yeah, I like the better when he had some intelligence and 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 right yeah, he, yeah, he didn't have the teeth or the claws, you know. It's yeah, like, and he's he's Hulk size. Yeah, he's like right, you know eight right. foot tall, like yeah. an alligator or a dinosaur or something. Yeah, he's you know? a dinosaur. He's a dinosaur in a lab coat now, you know, which which, which I just never liked. You know, so that that yeah. whole period of like the. Uh, up, up until up until they changed that was my favorite yeah. you know, uh, version of the lizard but that two issue that two issue story arc with john it's like there was something about again his body posturing with the character yeah. you know there's one shot it's a long shot of him like on the edge of a roof and he's hunched over and he's got his arms out he's bellowing and stuff like that i was like jesus he look how bestial this thing looks you know yeah yeah it was awesome it was awesome there, there's a shot of uh of spider-man on on a wall and the lizard on a wall, and they're facing like this, and the camera mm -hmm. angle is, is is canter levered, and you you just get uh, you know dizzy looking at it because yeah. it was just so wonderfully done. Yeah, well, and, that, that, that was one of the things that that uh, that those guys. I mean, when John was doing the FF, he constantly had down shots of the same, like Kirby did, you know. But like Ramita, there was my, my favorite Ramita cover, uh, Spider Man cover, is forty eight with the the back shot of the, of the vulture. Oh, that, okay. That Ultra Super you like Man. that cover? I love that cover because yeah. I think I think the feeling of vertigo when he's got the high horizon line and sort of the canyon of New York coming down the street. Yeah. And I, I, I just think that that there's a vulture coming. I think it's a great composition. I think the feeling of vertigo in that cover is fantastic. Hmm. I just think it, it, that cover has always worked for me. You know, cool. it, it's a back shot of, of, of a character. But for some reason, I just I absolutely love that cover. Love that cover. I, I love the cover of the Kingpin holding spider-man's arm and spider-man's down mm. uh and you're looking up at the two of them it's right in that same 69 uh, yeah that was it 69 that's yeah. it yep yeah yep I'm a, I'm, I'm, you can tell i'm what a geek i am it's like there's a certain oh, period yeah. where i could tell you what's on every single cover of every issue oh yeah yeah i i i one time at a convention uh i got challenged and i named uh i described the cover of every single spider-man issue from number one to 150 and I told you who drew it and who inked it. Uh huh. Yeah. <laughs> they didn't think I could do it. <laughs> yeah, see, I, I I would tap out after like one ten or one twelve, you know. Yeah, but you know, the, you got to get crap out of your brain to put new crap in. Right, so. right, exactly. <laughs> that stuff's gone, yeah. you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so you know, I'm like, oh, I know it's in the '60s. I know it's yeah. somewhere in there. Yeah. I'm kind of like, but that, that was a great story arc too. That 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 storyline with the oh, uh, the tablet. The tablet. The it started tablet, with yeah. Mysterio. Yeah. And then, oh my God, I love that storyline. Yeah, yeah, and I, I know when it this the Silvermane storyline with, with with with, and then from the Silvermane storyline into into the the the, the lizard. You know, mm -hmm. and, then, and then they then they start doing like one shots after that. You know, it's like uh, what were they? They the, the, yeah, the prowler, the chameleon, and the kangaroo, and yeah, yeah, the, you know. yeah. The the prowler, and then the uh, the guy with the uh, the shocker. The shocker was seventy two. Yeah, I'm thinking. No, what what was the guy? He, he, this was a really lame villain. The beetle. Nope. Uh, lamer than that. He was he was like a. It looked like a regular, like an Italian dude. But he had a cape. Oh, 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 wait, 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 oh, 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 wait a second. That's the little, the little guy. 
not, not he, had gray. Gray. He, he, he had gray in his hair. Oh, uh, oh, 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 the schemer. The schemer. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Schemer, who was the kingpin's son, right? Wasn't he the kingpin's son? Yes. 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 Yeah, I knew the kingpin was involved somehow. Yeah. And then and, and, and he had some dopey car, you know, like the schemer mobile. Or right, something. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That melt, <laughs> melted the snow off it. It was a hidden in the yes, snow. Yes, yes, yes. It was hidden in the snow drift. It just melted the snow and drove away. I know. It's so stupid. Oh, yeah. That, that was bad. <laughs> but you yeah. bought that stuff back then, you know, because it was fantasy. Oh yeah, you know, it didn't. It didn't have yeah. to make sense. It was just, oh, that's kind of cool. Yeah, not a lot of great villains came out of of that era, really. You know, if you think no. about the Ramita era, you got the Rhino, you got the Kingpin, uh, and then you've got yeah, the everybody vulture, else. There's the new Vulture, uh, the Blackie Drago Vulture. Came yeah, out and, I don't uh, count him. He's derivative. Right. Right. Yeah, yeah, you're right. I mean, there, there, there really wasn't, and 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 to this day, I mean, the, the main stable of villains are still the guys that Jack and Steve created. You know, when you yeah. think about it. Yeah, yeah, all, all the did all the Ditko ones. I mean, almost every issue had some new, really cool and bizarre look villain. and costume designs that you would never see today. You know what I mean? It's like they just they they thought so far outside the box as to what those characters should look like. You know, like who would create Craven today? You know, and right. I love right. I love the Craven costume. I really oh, yeah. It's it's just odd. It's ingenious. It really is. It's, well, it's, do you remember Pace Pot Pete? Yes. He, he became the the trapper, but he had the French beret uh, on the side, and he's carrying the plaster. You know, right. he's got the the art uh, smock on. Right, right. But then he's got this mug that it looks like, damn, this guy just looked like he came out of jail. You know. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. It, 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 it was great, it, and 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 think about it. Thor, if Thor were created today, because everybody's everybody's so rooted and stuff has to be realistic and yes. realistic reality. Yeah. Thor would never look like Thor. I mean, no. Thor, how did you come up with that costume for a character based on Norse mythology? You know, right? But it's brilliant. It's a brilliant costume. Yeah, yeah, yeah all that stuff. Everybody's too slavishly. Uh, uh, committed to realism and how can this like it's like how could you manufacture this for functionality a yeah right yeah right. Well, it's like who cares right who cares right you know when they you know when they redid superman when jim lee redid superman and all of a sudden he's got like armor on him it's like mm -hmm. he's superman what does he need right. freaking armor for? <laughs> yeah i know, I know. <laughs> you know? yeah Just extra lines and shit you know well, like, well, it's like iron man I, I i if you give me a character that i hate to draw he draw an iron man because everybody who has ever taken Iron Man on has made the armor more complicated than it was before. Right. You know, and, and it's just, it's a pain in the ass to draw from different angles. It really is. I mean, I love the 60s Iron Man armor. That that was, it was sleek. It got point across, but then they saw it to plate them and put all these plates and back plates and, you know, and right. I, it's, Jesus Christ, it's like to draw that is just, it, it's, 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 it's mind numbing. It really is, you know. And then I, the helmet got more complex. Mm -hmm. um, I remember I did a bunch of Iron Man stuff back in the early 2000s. And I found um, like a statue uh, of, of that new costume of that modern uh, armor. And I was able to, you know, move it around and stuff. Right. And that was very helpful. You need a maquette for something like that. You really yeah. do. Because it's yeah, you can, you can see it. Your head. Yeah. No, I agree. I agree. I, mean, I, I remember I did. Uh, what did they do? I, I did. I did. A, well, the last Marvel Masterpiece trading card set I did. They wanted certain Iron Man from certain story arcs and the armor from from that story arc. I'm like, Jesus Christ, look at this. How, do, how am I going to make this work from the angle I picked for the figure? Because the right. first thing you do is you pick out the poses for the for, for the composition. Now you got to fit the armor on that thing. And I right. and I'm t I, I have to keep asking people for reference. Like, does anybody have a shot of this armor from behind? Because I have no idea what the hell this armor looks like. And yeah, and and they don't. And the, the companies don't have turnaround shots anymore. No, no. No, there were no model. Oh, forget model sheets. Nobody uses model sheets anymore. So yeah. I, I, I remember when I did the Mary Jane poster and the Peter Parker posters back in the eighties. Like I had John Romita model sheets. You know, they had. They yeah. had I saw what Peter Parker would look like from every angle. What Mary Jane would look like from every angle. Mm -hmm. you know, it's like nobody does model sheets anymore because everybody just does what the hell they want with the characters. You know, so right. there's, there's no visual consistency. You right. know, which makes it difficult when you have to draw the character. Like, well, which which one do you want? You know. Right. Right. Yeah, you know, like I'm working on a book and I ask an editor uh, back in the day for reference. They just take it digital panels from stuff and send it to me. But it's not, I well, what do, what do his shoes look like? What do, right. 
I don't know. You've given me a waist high shot, you know? Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, or, or if I want to draw him and I have to see the bottom of his shoes or the back of his costume, you know what I mean? It's, I don't know what the back of his costume looks like. Exactly. No, I agree. I agree. So the, 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 the model sheets were, were invaluable if you were drawing a character you never drew before. And I, I don't think any company hands those out anymore or has them on hand, you know? I mean, I still have all of the handbook and the Marvel universe things that came out. Oh yeah. Entire, because every now and then you guys are a character. I whip those things out, you know, and it might not be updated, you know, I'll just right. have, hopefully they changed them. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully, <laughs> yeah. Hopefully not, you know? Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. So yeah, it, 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 it's, it's interesting. And, and, and I know, I know that, uh, that, that John had a hard time sometimes and they, they, would, they, would, they would redesign characters, you know, because it's like he was used to drawing the character the way he was used to drawing it. And mm -hmm. you could see when he was uncomfortable, you know, drawing stuff that, that he wasn't familiar with, you know, and you, yeah. hope, they, you hope the ink would clean it up later, you know. Yeah. Buscema, the, uh, I, I loved, he, he's one of the hardest characters to draw is the thing. And it, because nobody could get, the proportions right you know right. there's a very he's a very it's superman's another one he's very mm -hmm. hard for for artists to draw there's only a, f a handful of artists that i think superman uh, that do superman well right uh and right. the same thing goes for the thing uh yeah, I mean, but busema was one of them well interesting with, with Bisema, if you compare busema's thing to kirby's thing and, and i didn't do this until way later because you know i love oh, busema's doing a fantastic four and you kind of like his his round I, I think Byrne called him a teddy bear type type of thing. But then you mm -hmm. go look at, at Kirby's thing, and Kirby's thing. What was great about his it was the subtle. He was human proportion, but he was bigger. Like mm -hmm. he wasn't. He wasn't that round sort of fluffy thing that that Buscema did. Mm -hmm. You know, he if he was like the, the like the cover where he you know uh, um, this man this monster or the, you know where he's uh, and, yeah. and in the lab. And if you look at that cover, he's pretty much humanly proportioned. Mm -hmm. you know on that cover uh so it, it was interesting to, to look at at how much more angular kirby's version of the thing was than john's was john's was kind of round he did a round yeah. version of the thing balloony kirby, yeah yeah and kirby's was a lot more angular and and actually a lot more realistic than than john's was you know and, and so i I've, i found that to be interesting when i finally noticed that difference you know yeah like like kirby the way he would do it he could do it he could do scenes like uh uh, I think it was uh, FF 101 or 102, uh, which was Kirby's last one, where it's a splash page of the thing and he's got a cold and uh, 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 Crystal is feeding him like castor oil or something mm -hmm. like that. And, right, and, right. and he's got his nose plugged and his mouth open and his legs up on the table. And yeah. stuff. it's again, it's it's a nuanced pose, but with this monstrous figure, yeah. you know, uh, yeah. that. You really only Kirby could really nail. Yeah, so I, 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 if you have a chance after Rafi, yeah, take a look at, at the cover to uh, the FF fifty one. You'll see what I'm talking about. Oh as yeah, far as the, the the proportions on him compared to John's, you know, and mm -hmm. if you look at like FF one hundred seven, that first like thing no more thing cover that John did, and you'll see him how much more like rounded and blocky he is compared to to to, to Kirby's, mm -hmm. which is why I think Kirby Kirby will never obviously never be surpassed on the FF of his his book. Yeah. You know, Ramita, you know, when Ramita took over uh, with 103, right. I loved Ramita's versions. I mean, I was a little disappointed that Senate didn't ink uh, those first few uh, right. that Verporten did. But uh, Ramita, you know, was really bringing it, you know, mm -hmm. trying to capture that Kirby vibe, but still, you know, given that cool Ramita-esque stuff. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, I think from, I what John, from what John said, he wasn't comfortable on a team, but team books are tough, and, and you know, and from you know, from coming from from doing a one character book for a long time, I know that he was not he was not comfortable doing the team book. Uh, yeah, Ramita? Was, yeah, Ramita. Oh, okay. Yeah, which is why he lasted like what, what two issues? I think two or three issues. Uh, uh, might have been four. Was it four? It was, uh, 105. and then John took over with one hundred seven. Yeah, right. one hundred six. Right. So four. Right. Yeah. And then the Senate actually inked, uh, I think, the last two. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. You've met Joe, right? Senate. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 we became really good friends the last like, like I don't know, five or ten years of his life, and he was just in a, talking to him about inking stuff was absolutely amazing. You know, wow. it's, it's, it's his 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 faculties. It's like he remembered everything. About everything it was incredible, you know, and 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 it, and it, it, it here were obviously stories you can't tell, 
uh, about ink and different guys and stuff like that. I, I found really fascinating. But he's he was the guy when I was a kid. I wanted to learn to ink light. You know, and, and it's it, he was so clean. And I love the different texturing that he would put on trees and metal and right. Oh, you know, and, and 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 those little dots that he would put on the ground to make it look like like granite or gravel and stuff like right, that. Right, right. All stuff I picked up and which are really unique to him, you know, yeah. and stuff that he did, his little idiosyncrasies and stuff. And he I, didn't lose it either. I mean, no. when he passed away at 90, I forget what he was. It was like 90 or 91. Uh, his stuff was still great. Okay. See this? Yeah. This is a recreation that Joe did for me when he was 90 years old. 90 years old. Look at that. Ink line. I can. He was 90. Yeah. And he did this recreation for me. It's absolutely astonishing. Wow. That's yeah. amazing. It's That's an amazing. A, his piece. control yeah. is just unbelievable. We'd all like to be able to ink like him. Oh. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and watching him paint, I would watch him pencil head sketches at conventions and stuff like this. I would sit next to him, and he would pee pencil the way he inked. It was that tight. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. He would do like these Thor head sketches, or Dick, right? and they were like, "You're like, holy shit!" It's like he, it's like he inked it with a pencil. It was, it was a, astonishing to watch. It really was. Wow. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Really, and, and, and a humble man. Yeah. You know, oh. you'd never know that this guy was so, you know, amazing. Yeah, 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 yeah. It, it, it's, it's, it. Those guys back then, I, they, they seem. It's like I really, you really can't see them bad mouthing anybody. You know, it's like they all seem to have respect for the fact that other guys were working, you know what I mean? And they mm -hmm. needed to work. It's like, you know, John was John was great friends with Don Heck, you know. So yes. I, you know, it, it's it's you know, you didn't look at you you weren't friends with somebody because you respected their work. You were friends with somebody because you were friends with them and their work was like just what they did, you know. You weren't right. you weren't like jabbing them because it was they weren't as good as you or you didn't like what they did. It was it was more right. You just like to spend time with them and, yeah. and yeah. share, you know, the, the things that you love because you right. always You've got those things in common because, mm -hmm. you know, we all love a lot of the same things. It's just yeah. how we're wired. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I don't think there was the kind of this competitiveness that there is today, you know, between those guys. I yeah. really don't. I think they all just, they were happy to have work, you know, and they were, they yeah. were happy that their friends had work, you know. Yeah. They, they, they were workmen. They, you know, it's uh, a lot of those guys treated their jobs like uh, they were, you know, city workers working, mm -hmm. in a, you know, in a sewer or a bus driver or something like that. Yeah. You know, th they had these skills uh, and they were able to use them and get paid for it. But it was primarily you took a job, you know, you, you weren't insulted by, you know, the fact that you got offered this romance job. No, I got offered a job. Right. You know, right. and I got I got bills to pay and I got mouths to feed and they they took it and there was no mm -hmm. superstardom. There was none of that image. Yeah, of, yeah, and, and then they rock they, and roll world, and they put the same amount of effort in, into whatever they they were doing, which shows like John's romance books. You know, his daughter told me he sure. hated doing the romance books. Those romance books are gorgeous. Yeah, you know, they're gorgeous mm -hmm. because if you're going to do it, you do it well. You know, right? Yeah, that's that's a great craftsman. You know, yeah, agreed. Yeah, we need we need more of those. <laughs> <laughs> Instead, you have us. <laughs> I mean, the other guys. <laughs> oh, man. Well, Joe, I think we'll wrap it up here. I want to thank you again for coming on. I uh, had a great time talking about Big JB with you. Yeah, Hope you had a good time. This was a lot of fun. It really was. Good. Thanks so much. Oh, oh, hopefully, we'll get to see each other at a con uh, or two this year. Yeah, definitely. Um, uh, I'm sorry I wasn't able to get out there when Andy was up. Um, uh, he well, was stop. supposed to come. He and Bart were supposed to come out this way, and then something came up, and he couldn't. Uh, Bart had the home reno I know going on, and you know, and I think there's some other stuff going to because I, I met Andy for lunch that oh, day. Oh, that's what it was. Bart had Bart a plumber or something had to come. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. How far is he from you? He's not that uh, far, right? I'm not Bart? sure. He can't be. He can't be that far from me. Yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. not sure where Bart is. I don't know. Okay. But uh, yeah, yeah I, well, I, we'll, we'll, we'll try to figure out what, well, you know, I, I'm, I'm trying to put together my con schedule for the first time in two years uh, mm -hmm. uh, now. So I'll, I'll let you know where I'm going to be. And hopefully okay. we can pick up at a couple. Yeah. If uh, uh, once the weather breaks, I'm, I'm planning on heading out that way. Um, uh, maybe meeting Bart somewhere halfway or something. Oh, or, let me know. Or just let going know. out to, to Syracuse. I'll let you know. And maybe the three of us can get yeah. together and Absolutely. hang out and tell lies, you know. Absolutely. It sounds great. Sure. <laughs> 
<laughs> sure, I'll, pretend awesome. like, I'll pretend I like you. You pretend you like me, and we'll. we'll yeah. have yeah. <laughs> I think we can do better than that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. This was a lot of All fun. Right. All right. Thanks a lot, Joe. Thanks, everybody in the chat. Uh, we will see you next week. Have a good one. Bye-bye.